Journalists often have a front row seat as history unfolds. And over the last 30 years, today's guest has been witness to a scandal in Arkansas that reverberated in Washington. The attacks of 9-11, America's wars, and every presidential campaign in between. He's David Schuster this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Joining me as he always does is my great friend, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Every week we sit down and talk about big ideas with great guests, storytellers, journalists, authors, and more to make sense of the big stories shaping the United States today. This week we're joined by Emmy-winning newsman, David Schuster. David, thank you so much for being with us. Jim, I'm not sure I'm so great and worthy of your show, but it is an honor to be with you amidst everything. Thank well, you. And hello well, to Wayne. Nice to well, be with you as well. Well, we think you're pretty great. You, you, your new project is called Quick Hits. Tell us about it. So a group of uh, out-of-work uh, journalists, uh, broadcast network journalists, uh, we were all sitting at home several months ago wondering what are we going to do? We're missing out on the big story. And one of my buddies came up with this technology that enables uh, six different Skype sources all at once in a virtual control room to be directed. And we thought, you know what, with so many broadcasters who are doing this from their home studios, we can do this. And so we just started it up, a group of journalists that we try to keep each show at a less than 15 minutes because we don't think people want to hear all the day's news across the United States and around the world and anything longer than that because it's so depressing, most of it. And, and we're having fun, great chemistry. Again, very brief, succinct reporting from journalists, not necessarily pundits. And so far, so good. We're looking to try to expand it. Well, you know, one of the things that strikes me about it is it's like you said, it's 15 minutes of news. Uh, if, I, if I put on any cable news channel, any cable news channel, I get the same story at the top of every hour, at the bottom of every hour. Different packages, sure, and, and different talking heads, but it's the same thing over and over again. If you're interested in just sort of getting a, 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 a I'm sorry to say, a quick hit of the news, it seems to me like you've you've you found the recipe here. Well, we hope so. I mean, we we go through 12 to 14 top stories across the United States and around the world every day. We use the formula that has worked in TV, and that is live conversational kind of fast exchanges. Uh, but these are veteran broadcast journalists who know how to synthesize something into 45 seconds to a minute. And so there's reactions to each other's reporting. Each of us are taking a, a main story that we like and adding some sugar plums, as we say, some extra information. And so far, I mean, we're having we're having a great time. The stories, of course, are depressing, but we think we're adding a lot of data, some great graphics, some uh, network quality people who are putting the, the screen together for us. So, uh, so we'll see. I mean, I think it's kind of silly, perhaps, to try to start a new news business in the midst of the worst economic environment in broadcast history. <laughs> but what else are we going to do? You know, so here we are. <laughs> so you were telling us off air that one of the features you have on your new show is actually good news. Talk about that. And and you related, it was a marvelous story to us before. Get yeah, so that. every broadcast, we believe, despite all the horrific news, we always want to end each show with something that's kind of uplifting, that restores everybody's faith in humanity. So, for example, the other week, it was Shaquille O'Neal who pulled over the basketball star who pulled over to the side of the road to help a motorist. Uh, today, for example, we're doing a story about uh, a guy who's a World War II veteran in London. Uh, he used to ride motorcycles, Harleys, and so his friends outfitted his mobile scooter to look like a Harley so he could rumble around the neighborhood. We've done stories about people who are making masks, people who are giving away lots of monies, people who give tips to waitresses, all that sort of thing. And it's just a constant reminder every day that as bad as the news may be, as depressing as it is, there is something happening every day if you look for it uh, that can restore your faith in humanity and give you a glimmer of hope about these horrific circumstances we all face. I, th I think it's a great idea for sure. You have worked at every major cable news network during your long and distinguished career. So you're in a very good position to sort of judge the state of broadcast news in general today and realizing this could be a very long discussion. Give us an overview. Where is broadcast news standing today in, in, in late July 2020? 
Well, I'd say it's mixed. Uh, my impulse is to say that it's uh, that it's terrible, that it doesn't serve the public benefit, that so much of news is designed now to simply draw people's attention, uh, to stretch people out so that they have to spend more and more time watching the news when, in fact, uh, the news is uh, perhaps overly dramatized uh, for, for the broadcaster's benefit. And yet there is still some great reporting that's out there on things like the, the COVID epidemic or the relationship between the United States and Russia and China or economic news. So I'd say it's, I'd say it's mixed. I think, um, again, to me, the key has always been that if people who are news consumers really want a terrific sort of balanced look at the world and really want to be better informed, uh, don't rely on just one cable channel or just one broadcast network. Try to get as many different pieces of information, different types of shows, your show, for example, and, and, and sort of have this whole sort of menu that you bring to play, because I do think, look, all of us have our strengths and weaknesses with the product that we're doing. And I think the more that news consumers can have a variety of sources uh, of their broadcast news, the better it's going to be for all of us. And so, David, you know, this is 2020 has been uh, the longest decade of my life, right? It's, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> very well. <put. laughs> it's, it's only July, but you know, the, the we've had a, a, a pandemic that has already killed, uh, you know, approaching 150,000 Americans as we're taping this. Uh, we've had uh, the murder of George Floyd and the protests that ensued from that. And you know, the year began with the impeachment and a, a trial of a president. Um, how? What are the challenges of producing a daily news program? in that kind of environment where every day seems to bring something that once upon a time would have consumed weeks of coverage. I think the challenge is simply to, to try to cover it all, to do it a matter of fact as possible. There's so much out there for people to be emotional about that uh, we don't need to, to provide any emotion to say 150,000 is dead or 4 million cases is terrible. People can make that connection themselves. Our job is to be as credible and as source-based as possible and say, okay, Johns Hopkins University says, that 40 states have the numbers going up the last two weeks compared to the previous two weeks. People can decide for themselves what that means, but again, to try to be as efficient as possible and try to make sure that we are covering uh, all these different stories, that we're not taking COVID to the exclusion of politics or to the exclusion of U.S. race relations, that the Trump daily Twitter feed is not dominating everything else. And, and again, it's just trying to keep a focus on sort of the big picture. That's at least uh, our challenge. And again, the other challenge is simply to try to remind people um, that uh, these are unbelievable times, that these are the worst times that any of us, maybe any American has ever gone through in the, in the last 120 years, because if you go back all the way to the Depression, at least people then had a sense of community. They could stand in line for soup kitchens. They could have their family members take care of them. Here, we're essentially all on our own. You can't yeah. exchange hugs. You can't exchange embraces and, and all that sort of thing. So it's in some ways, I would say it's even worse. So do you also, in addition to watching uh, cable news and broadcast news, do you look to local, regional, and national newspapers to, to get a, a, a broad spectrum, a broad selection of the news as it's unfolding? Because obviously there are still plenty of great newspapers doing great work too. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and unfortunately, I mean, those great newspapers, now you have to find them online, right? But uh, I, you know, I probably have six to 10 different local newspapers up and down the East Coast in my hometown in Indiana, out West, where I go to every day, I go to the website just to check up on what's the local view of what they're doing and what's happening in COVID or race relations. And in many cases, I found that, for example, you know, going to the, the newspapers in Portland, you get a better, more accurate, in-depth perspective of the 60 days plus of protests and confrontation between protesters and police than you might necessarily get from the Washington Post or the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. So in a way, trying to figure out, okay, go to where the stories are coming from, check out the local media there. And that's been, to me, the most helpful way to stay on top of it all. David, you uh, have been a long time observer of American politics. I, I remember, I think, uh, was it the, two, the 2000 campaign when you were on the bus with John McCain? Yeah. Uh, and I remember watching you then. I, I, you know, I'm curious your thoughts about the the way American politics has moved, uh, both in terms of the the grand scope of of national politics, uh, but also how you think that the two parties have evolved. The GOP that you saw up close and personal on the campaign trail in, in 2000, to the GOP of today, as well as the Democratic Party. Wow, that's a uh, that's a uh, great question. I'd say also a, a tough question. The overall theme that I have is that I think our politics is even more broken than it was uh, 20 years ago. And the reason is, I think, because of the amount of money that is sloshing through the system uh, that is enabling the establishment of both parties to essentially largely sort of hold their people in line. Every, both parties are still beholden to Wall Street and corporate interests. 
Uh, you have a, 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 a dramatic transformation, like, for example, like what Bernie Sanders was going to bring with free college education, Medicare for all. I mean, fundamental transformations of our society. And he was doing well in the primaries until the Democratic establishment said, OK, enough. We all have to gang up on him, unite behind Joe Biden, despite the number of losses Joe Biden had. And Bernie Sanders was done. I think our political system, because of the money, makes it exceptionally difficult for a real outsider who wants to append the system to really do that. Now, you could argue, well, that's what Donald Trump said he was going to He was going to drain the swamp. He was an anti-Washington yeah. figure. And yet in office, he has been as beholden to the same corporate interests, lobbying interests as any politician before him. And it's really only his rhetoric and his style that is still sort of anti-Washington. So I look at it as, look, you know, we have a, a, a society now in the United States where, what, 40 million Americans are unemployed. Of those Americans who are employed, something like half, 50, 50 million are in service industry jobs. In other words, they're in jobs where they're living paycheck, paycheck to paycheck. And the gap between wealth and poor continues to grow. I think and until our political system can figure out a way to get money out of politics and restore the balance between the people at the low end of the scale, the people at the high end of the scale, I think our political outcomes will continue to favor those who have a lot of money, uh, a lot of uh, corporate influence. And as a result, fundamental changes won't happen. And I think the great divide that we've seen in our society will continue to be uh, represented in our politics as well. So we have now, obviously, uh, a presidential campaign that has been scaled back significantly starting in March. Uh, we all know the, the different events that have been canceled, in-person appearances have been scaled back and, and are you know, following social distancing rules. The Republican National Convention is not gonna happen and we could go on. Realizing that we're in late July, how do you see the rest of this campaign year, the presidential election year of 2020 shaping up between now, late July and early November when People cast ballots. Yeah, my sense is this is going to be um, what a lot of us had feared over years, and that is that the influence of money and television ads um, is essentially going to make or break this election. Like all of us are going to have to make a decision, not based on getting an opportunity to go to a rally or to see a candidate in person or even see necessarily how they react on a debate stage, but literally, what is their message on uh, television with their ads or on the internet? Uh, and that's where the campaign is, is going to be fought. Um, and it worries me that if this is a close election, um, that we're all in a lot of trouble because not only have we been influenced by the media in terms of how people portray themselves and what the candidates want to focus on as opposed to answering questions from ordinary Americans or from journalists or whatnot, but now also the outcome, I fear, is going to be uh, dependent on people's sort of faith in media as an institution at a time when we don't really have that confidence in the media. So. I know I'm sort of veering off topic. Uh, my sense, the good thing about it is that I think because uh, when you're talking about an election of, a, of, a, of an incumbent, uh, an incumbent president, it's usually a referendum on that incumbent. You're also talking about a guy like Joe Biden who has been vetted before. So you're talking about two quantities, two entities where the public pretty much knows a lot about both of them. Um, and so perhaps maybe that that helps us a little bit to sort of make the choice. But um, but look, I, I'm, I'm fearful about this election. I'm fearful about how it's gonna how it's gonna play out with so many people being afraid to cast a ballot because of COVID. I'm fearful about the lack of trust that people may have in the results. Um, and I'm also fearful about what does it say about a society that has to make a decision virtually. So the polling now is trending uh, pretty much together or, or you know universally against Donald Trump. Joe Biden holds a significant lead in most polls, you know, you know, 10 to 20, 10 to 12 percent or so. That's again, as of now, late July. Do you see any factors that could or would change that? And again, realizing that polling is an inexact science, but it's it's a bit of a science. It's not, you know, like imaginary. Well, you know, when I came on your show four years ago, and I think I was a voice in the uh, the loneliness, uh, the wilderness, saying, you know, watch out, I think Hillary's going to lose to Donald Trump. A lot of my friends who watched your show said, Shoo, sir, you don't know anything about Donald Trump. <laughs> time, I'm not going to say that uh, Joe Biden is going to lose to Donald Trump. I think actually Joe Biden is in a very, very strong position. Again, not so much having to do with Joe Biden, but I think the country is so disgusted um, by America that was once the, you know, we once had the can-do spirit here in the United States. We could tackle anything. Um, if there was a, you know, sending somebody to the moon or, or, or trying to deal with something like a catastrophe or the World Trade Center attacks, America eventually found its way uh, and overcame it. 
I feel like this is the first time when American voters don't have that confidence now in the American people, that they feel that there has been something missing from leadership at the top, that states are having to fend for themselves, communities are having to fend for themselves. It's everybody on their own. There's not a sort of unifying presence in terms of how we're going to battle this. And I think people are frankly embarrassed that the United States is worst in the world in terms of the number of deaths and the number of total cases. And they're going to take it out on Donald Trump and say, whether it's fair or not, Donald Trump, the buck stops with him. He's the person at the top. And they're going to associate this sort of period of being embarrassed about America with him. And I'm not sure there's any way that Donald Trump can recover unless somehow, miraculously, in the next you know, 90 some days, suddenly we come up with a vaccine or the coronavirus numbers drop dramatically and the economy starts to roar back. But I just I just don't see it happening that quickly. You know, there's a, a refrain that we've heard from President Trump uh, when he's been asked about whether or not he would uh, accept the outcome of the November election. Uh, and he sort of takes a wait and see attitude. Uh, Tim Murtaugh, who's the uh, RNC press spokesman, uh, similarly uh, recently took the, the same position that we would wait and see about the about the the integrity of the election. Do you have any credible, serious concerns about the integrity of the American vote? Yes, um, my concerns are that uh, at a time when, again, I think voting processes, voting machines uh, are can be hacked uh, at a time when you have very few uh, voting locations in some precincts and lots in others. I think it's very easy to sort of tip the scales, whether it's you know subversive hacking, whether it's uh, political figures in a state who want to somehow help one side or the other. Uh, and then the other part about it is, again, I think there is this general sort of lack of confidence that everybody has in institutions. And as a result, people may have a lack of confidence in the outcome, particularly if you have a Donald Trump saying, I don't believe that this race yeah. in Ohio or Michigan is over because there's still a few thousand votes. And look at all the mail-in ballots. And we know also that it's going to take a while to count some of the mail-in ballots. And because of COVID-19, you have the situation where I think a lot of people as energized as they may be to vote, I think there are going to be some people who are going to say, to hell with it. I can't vote because, you know, the virus is spreading, or I don't want to wait in line, or I'm going to go a mail-in ballot, but am I going to get it in time or not? The Postal Service is being cut back. Is the mail-in ballot going to arrive when it's supposed to? There's so many different ways that you can look at this election and say, this is not going to work. And my yeah. fear is that there's going to be a strong majority of people out there who are going to look at this election and, and identify all of the problems that we know are going to crop up on election day and the days afterwards and say, this race is still too close. It's been tainted. It's unfair. And then people can have faith in the outcome. Uh, and I think that's a very real possibility, except for one scenario. If it is a total blowout, if it is a play, if it is election where Joe Biden wins in places like Texas and Arizona and North Carolina and Georgia and Donald Trump only wins, you know, two or three states, then fine, that's it, that's the election. But I think if it is relatively close, uh, then I have real fears about uh, what's going to happen this, in November and December. So, I mean, you, you, you've you also been uh, the, the, the managing editor and uh, anchor for an international uh, news uh, broadcast, I-24. I, how, how does that, you know, if American democracy is, is that fragile, how does that, what does that communicate to the rest of the world? communicates that America is failing, that we are witnessing the failure of the once great United States of America, that we are turning into perhaps what the old Soviet Union used to be when it was disintegrating. You can go through example after example, but that the United States experiment is not working. And we're seeing it play out either in terms of the economy, in terms of the response to COVID-19, in the response of you know universities and people who go to college and then end up with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, the world looks at us and we've had you know guests at both my you know previous jobs at I twenty four and Al Jazeera. They just they couldn't understand how is it possible that particularly in the United States that if you get sick, that that can cause you to be bankrupted, that it can cause you millions of dollars of medical bills if you get a disease that through no fault of your own. I mean, I think most of the world looks at that and thinks it's crazy. Now, the world also envies the American ingenuity and, and, and how, you know, the productivity of America and how wealthy we are. But the idea that America has lost its ability to take care of people who face unforeseen emergencies or circumstances uh, strikes the rest of the world as sad. And I just can't understand why is it that the United States hasn't been able to fix this? We've been talking about some of these issues for years. Medicare for all. I mean, health care for all was something that Richard Nixon had once talked about some, you know, 50 years ago. 
Well, and here we are, nothing has really changed except that the powers that govern healthcare in the United States, the corporate powers, the insurance companies, they seem to be even more powerful than ever. And the people who are stuck without healthcare, um, you know, they're left holding the bat with the exception of COVID-19 and the effort by Congress this year to say, okay, your medical bills for COVID-19 will be covered. But that's that's it. Well, if we can cover COVID-19, why can't we cover somebody who develops cancer or somebody who has a heart attack or somebody who's in pretty good health who suddenly develops diabetes or some other disease? It doesn't, it doesn't seem to make sense to the rest of the world. So I want to get back to the November election. All of the factors you described in terms of potential chaos, if it is a close election, A, what happens? What do we do then? And B, is there a chance the losing candidate will not accept the vote? Where do we go? What happens? I realize we're talking, you know, a bit of conjecture here, but it's something that people have been thinking about and talking about. I certainly hear it and see it on social media and conversations with friends. I think the passions are so strong on both sides that it's a very real possibility that uh, Donald Trump, if it's close and he's declared the loser, will say, no, this was an invalid election. I think it's also possible there may be a temptation for Joe Biden and the Democrats if it's close and he's declared the loser to say, no, wait a second. We have all of this, um, you know, hijinks that was underway in all these states. Let's continue counting the votes. I think what's going to end up happening is it's going to be dependent on uh, it's going to be dependent on party elders in both parties to come to whoever the loser is and say, okay, enough. It's going to require <clears throat> Mitch McConnell. It's going to require people, whoever may be close to, <clears throat> excuse me, to Donald Trump, maybe members of his family, Ivanka Trump, others to say, okay, for your legacy, you have to say enough is enough. We fought the good fight. We did the best we can honor the view of the American people. And I think I'm at least optimistic that Donald Trump, for example, even if he says, I'm not ready to concede yet in November, that several weeks into this, if it still shows that he has lost, I'm confident that at least a member of his family or somebody that he respects will go to him and say, enough, let's end this. Likewise, I'm confident that as much as Barack Obama and Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton may just detest the idea of Joe Biden possibly losing this election, but if in fact he has lost this election and we've gone through whatever recounts we have to go through, I'm confident that they will then go to him and convince Joe Biden, you know what? was terrible when Hillary Clinton lost four years ago. Yes, it's, it's as horrible as it is now. Who knows what direction America is going in, but the one principle we have to honor is that the American vote is paramount. And I think Joe Biden would also listen to those people. In the weeks before we taped this, the, the news broke that uh, of, of reports that Russian intelligence was paying uh, Taliban to, uh, for, for, for essentially a bounty on American soldiers. Uh, there have been a number of engagements between the White House press corps and the president since then where he just has not been asked that question about wh what he knows, what he thinks about that assessment, or even whether he spoke about that with uh, President Putin when they spoke on the phone recently. To a casual observer, I, we, I think most people look at that and say, if they're thinking about this issue, why, why doesn't he ask that question? As someone who's, who's been to the White House, as someone who has covered politics at the highest levels, does it mean something different to you uh, that that question has not been asked of this president? Yeah, to me, it's unforgivable. <clears throat> Excuse me. To me, it's unforgivable that uh, the White House press corps and some of the Sunday show hosts who have interviewed President Trump have not raised this issue. Now, I get that there are White House officials who are spinning reporters saying, look, we don't even believe that this story is true. If it is true, well, this is probably a local decision that was made maybe by, you know, local Russian commanders that it didn't go all the way up to Putin. We have no intelligence to suggest that it did. That's fine for them to sort of spin reporters and offer that excuse. But that excuse needs to come out of the mouth of the president of the United States. And I think it's incumbent. And I've been shocked and, and sadly disappointed by the number of White House press uh, core members who over the last couple of weeks, they've had face time with the president of the United States. They've had opportunities to ask him questions when or shout questions at him. Why doesn't somebody say, Mr. President, what about the Russian alleged Russian payments to the Taliban for bounties on U.S. troops? What happened? And then he can go in and say, this is <clears throat> fake news or not a story or it doesn't really matter or, you know, Putin had nothing to do with it, but at least put him on the record for it. And I think it's been a dereliction of duty that the press corps hasn't put this on the record. Why haven't they? Uh, they, they haven't, clearly. And I would agree. It's a question that should have been, needs to be asked. 
Well, Wayne, I think there are two reasons. First, Afghanistan has largely been forgotten. I think there are a lot of people covering the White House who don't remember the early stages of the Afghan war. And secondly, I think the White House has done a fairly effective job of trying to tamp down the story and say, it's not true. There's nothing to indicate that Putin knew. And as a result, White House reporters who may not really care about Afghanistan to begin with in the midst of race relations and COVID-19 and politics, it may be the fourth or fifth and a best case scenario uh, item on their agenda. And so they just figure, ah, somebody else will eventually ask it. So, so I won't. Um, and it's, again, it's sad, um, but that's sort of the world we live in. You have a story like that, which should be such a huge story, but given everything else, it's, it's far down the list. Hey, David, we're uh, down to about 30 seconds here. I'm wondering, uh, producing a, a show from home, like we're doing here today, I'm in Massachusetts, Wayne's in Rhode Island, you're in Connecticut. Well, how's that uh, challenge been for you? Well, it's extremely challenging, Jim, because I don't have the great baseball bobbleheads behind me. I just have a Western <laughs> and Wayne has this nice attic that is reporting. And so you know, we're, it's, it's challenging in the sense we're all stuck with the circumstances we have to try to make it look as simple as possible and don't distract the viewers. The technology is also a little bit challenging to coordinate. Um, but you know what? I think the audience is used to this. People are used to the idea of, you know what? We're all in this together. We all are stuck at home. Reporters should be reporting from their home studios. I would be surprised if I saw a reporter in the field. So you know, we're making it work as best we can. Well, David, uh, Quick Hits is something some everybody should check out. They can find it at quickhits.tv. Is that right? Quickhits.tv.com uh, or quickhitsnews.com. And if it takes you to the, uh, to the one-armed bandit stories, you know you've gone to the wrong place. <laughs> there you go. David Schuster, it's Quick Hits. Thank you so much for being with us. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can visit us on Facebook or Twitter or find us at PellCenter.org, where you can also catch up on previous episodes. For G. Wayne Miller, I'm Jim Lutis, asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.